I want to welcome you to Serving USA's first Zoom gathering of the summer. On behalf of our team, thank you and much appreciation to each of you joining us today. We know you have a million things that you could be doing this hour. Your choice to work with, to care for some of the most critical in need in our communities is to be commended. We notice and we recently began offering a variety of Zoom presentations, hopeful to educate, inspire, and bring together partners and friends. I am excited to introduce today our expert leader, Nicole Lender, Executive Director of Fresno's Marjorie Mason Center. When Serving USA began on a vision of expansion to include specifically helping organizations aiding women out of incarceration, survivors of domestic violence was especially important. We learned one in four women has experienced intimate partner violence or will in her lifetime. We knew our assistance was needed to offer support for transformations in their lives, their families' lives. It was our great fortune to learn Nicole had taken over leadership at Marjorie Mason. Nicole leads her team by example and demonstrates patience and compassion to her residents. I respect her for being so no nonsense, but so kind and balancing that fine line representing and managing an extensive team. Also for asking the hard but necessary questions on behalf of her clients. Most of all, I deeply respect that she answered the calling in her life to lead this group. And since then she has poured her heart and her soul into her work. Before Nicole tells you more about her adventures leading Marjorie Mason Center, our moderator, Kevin Drenth, has some directions for how we'll operate on today's call. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Stephanie, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, today's uh, webinar is gonna be a little bit more discussion intensive, uh, so we'd like to invite you, if, if you'd like to join us on video and uh, audio, uh, to kind of join a discussion and be heard and be seen if you'd like. Uh, we also would like you, to encourage you to, uh, if you have any questions, enter them in the chat uh, or raise your hand at any time. Um, if you kind of mouse over the bottom of your Zoom application, you should see the option, a little hand icon to raise your hand. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask um, if you'd like to join us with video, uh, raise your hand um, and I can bring you on over uh, into this uh, screen. I'll give everyone a second. Yeah. So you'll be disconnected for just a second and then be brought over. And of course, also please note that there's a chat window also in the bottom uh, center of your screen. So at any time during the discussion, if you'd like to input there, uh, we encourage that. Thank you. Uh, now I'm gonna pass it off to Nicole um, and get the webinar started. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting uh, me, inviting Marjorie Mason Center to participate in this conversation. Um, I appreciate not only the partnership with Serving USA, and I can't think of another, um, another funding agency that is such a strong um, and intimate and closely aligned partner um, with its, its organizations that it funds. And so I just want to compliment and thank Serving USA. Um, I also am going to apologize. Uh, I, as in talking with both Stephanie and Kevin, there has been a lot going on in the last 24 hours that has caused me to be a little bit off kilter. Um, and so, you know, we had an earthquake about, you know, two and a half hours ago. Um, I also last, uh, last night participated in a, in a panel with my church um, that was a, a live broadcast panel on racism. Um, and so I've got a whole bunch of things swirling in my head in addition to these topics. So if I stutter a little bit, um, or I pause to collect myself, uh, I want to apologize. I also want to be very, very clear. And I think if I've learned anything personally over the last 60 days is to be transparent about the lens from which you come. And as Stephanie said, um, I, was, I was blessed to give an be given an opportunity and, and really a, a, a call to be at the Marjorie Mason Center in this leadership role, which is an honor that I don't take lightly. Um, but I also recognize I, I come at it through a lens that I'm not personally a survivor of domestic violence. Um, and as we'll talk later, I'm, I'm not a person of color. And so when I am talking and I'm giving information, I'm giving as the leader of an organization, but through the lens of other people. Um, and, and, and I understand that my background does color that 
um, in a way that is different from somebody else. So I just think it's really important to share um, and to acknowledge that going forward. So um, who is the Marjorie Mason Center? Um, it's interesting when you're named after a person that nobody can ever really figure out what you do. Um, in Fresno, obviously people are much more familiar. Um, we started in, I believe, 1904 as a YWCA, Young Women Christian Association. Um, I still have the hand signed minutes from their very first meeting, which is a really cool documentation as an organization to have. Um, but in 1978, Marjorie Mason was a young woman in our community who was tragically and, and brutally assaulted and murdered by a former boyfriend um, who happened to also be a member of law enforcement. And that was in the 70s. Um, it hit national news for multiple reasons. One, obviously, was a homicide. Um, but that it was a, it, the homicide happened at the hands of a, a, a sheriff's deputy. Um, and uh, even more tragically, many of the officers were outside at the time. Many of them are still living, and I've heard stories. Um, and it was shocking back then. Um, out of that, the YWCA started setting aside bets for victims of domestic violence until 1998. Um, the board peacefully severed ties with the National Association and became its own 501c3 specifically as a center. Um, what I will say is, you know, we have grown significantly. In California, every county has a domestic violence victim service response um, through California Office of Emergency Services. In Fresno, uh, we are the only comprehensive domestic violence service provider. Um, what's unique about that is in Fresno, our call rates to law enforcement for domestic violence per capita are the largest in the state for all large cities. We are geographically wide, we have high crime volume, um, and you have a single service provider. Um, who and where we are today, um, we offer 24-7 crisis intervention, and that is live. So people on the phone, um, people who can respond in person in our office, we have um, advocates, or we call them navigators as well, who can respond out on the scene. That's obviously altered due to COVID, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So whether it's a hospital, whether it's another nonprofit, whether they get uh, called out by law enforcement and get dispatched and go out, um, because the root of domestic violence is power and control, and it, it's, it's in between two people who love each other. So even though uh, an individual will want the violence and the, the hurting behavior to stop, they don't actually want their loved one to become arrested or taken to jail um, because they still love them and there are still hopes for reconciliation oftentimes. Um, so we have our crisis, crisis intervention, crisis response. We help people obtain uh, domestic violence restraining orders. Uh, we help with court accompaniment. Um, one of probably the uh, largest occupancy of our agency budget, obviously outside of uh, personnel, is emergency shelter. Um, we have a 144 bed emergency shelter in Fresno. It too is the largest in the state of California. I think it's actually potentially one of the largest in the country. Most people have small domestic violence shelters, but because we are utilizing existing facilities, um, we have a large capacity. Um, again, that too has changed with COVID and we can talk a little bit about that in a second. We have emergency housing, we have transitional housing, um, we have what's called rapid rehousing, which those of you that aren't in the housing business, it means that we utilize government programs that help put people in their own apartment if they qualify for up to a year with ongoing services such as case management and counseling and child advocacy, um, assistance with uh, getting a job, assistance with financing. Um, and that helps us really walk people through their journey to where they're way more self-sufficient when they leave um, our, our hands. And so. Um, about a million dollars of our agency budget um, is in that rapid rehousing, and it has been a successful kind of wraparound um, holistic approach to providing services for survivors. Um, we have, on, on a given day between all of those programs, we are housing about 400 adults and children every day. Every day. Um, which is very interesting because I am sure, no matter what community you're in, you're having conversations about homelessness. Everybody is having conversations about homelessness. And there is a very big disconnect between domestic violence and homelessness. And most people will say, but they're not on the street and they're not homeless. Um, we really gotta get rid of those people that are, um, there's crime on the street, they're littering, they're, they, are, uh, they are 
ill and they need mental health or physical health support. And so there's a complete disconnect that domestic violence is homelessness because we're not seeing them because they're coming from their own home sometimes. Sometimes they're coming from a loved one's home, a friend, a family. Sometimes they are coming from the street, but oftentimes the survival will come directly from their own home because they will stay in their home and endure a whole lot more than they ever would or could or should because of the fear of being homeless on the street with their kids. Um, and so I, I did think that was important to point out. Um, we do all forms of counseling, individual group counseling. Uh, we offer a group called SAFE, which is uh, an acronym for Survivors of Abuse, Free and Empowered. Um, and so we try to, and these are both community-based and residential, but the goal is, again, to help people unpack um, the, the deep, long-term psychological and emotional abuse that they have endured. That the bruises, the physical abuse will disappear. Um, but the one thing we do know is the, the psychological and the emotional abuse could last throughout their lifetime. So how do we help them unpack what has happened to them and help them give them tools um, in order to be able to cope um, and for the most part, you know, what to look for in the next relationship um, and how to have a healthy relationship. Because most of us, once we, there is a desire, you know, we were designed and created to be in relationship with one another. And so there will be that ongoing desire. And so for both the, the victim, for the offender, um, and for their children, the goal is to give them tools in order to have healthy relationships. Um, we have multiple programs. Um, throughout the community. We have seven physical locations. Um, and then finally, we do have a program for those who have been convicted of domestic violence. Um, we run a 52-week batters intervention, anger management. We have a class for people who um, have both uh, been victimized, but also have been an aggressor, um, because oftentimes we see both behaviors. Um, last year, we only represent one zip code in Fresno County. Uh, last year, we served 850 adults in that program. Um, so just to give you an idea of the volume of the work we do, and that would be men, women, uh, teens. Uh, we, we serve anybody in that program. Um, so a little bit, that's a little bit about us. Uh, last year, we served about 7,500 adults and children, and that was separate from the, the uh, Batters Intervention Program, which we call our Life Transition Program. Um, the last thing would be obviously our mission to uh, prevent and end the cycle of violence in, in, through, in our community through education and advocacy. So we do a lot through social media. We have youth programs in the high school called No More, teaching kids about teen dating violence and healthy relationships. Um, I think the most difficult pill for me to swallow, maybe because I have an almost 16-year-old myself, is that teen dating violence is uh, is higher, the rates are higher than adults. One in three teenagers will experience teen dating violence throughout their teenage years. And so talking to their kids, uh, talking to kids, talking to parents, talking to teachers, talking to school counselors about healthy relationships in a way that, that they can hear and listen because, I mean, if I'm gonna be honest, I, I didn't have to have conversations with my parents about um, cell phone use because um, the cell phone that I used in high school came with its own luggage and plugged into like the car battery or, or the cigarette charger for a battery charger, you know, I mean, not cigarette, the battery charger. And, and we are in a different generation now where um, kids are overly exposed and there's so much um, that you have to think through and talk with them about. And their relationships look different because their relationships are through and intertwined with technology and social media. And so that's a really critical component for us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, or I, I was asked obviously to talk about COVID-19 um, and how that has impacted us. Um, it has completely um, changed everything, um, but not in the way we originally thought. Um, I know there was lots of media, and I will say for the first couple, maybe the first six weeks, so from maybe early March till May 1, um, we did see an increase in calls. Um, not always calls, we saw an increase in contacts. Um, we saw people that were reaching out to us in a whole lot of different ways that we had to quickly uh, triage and create new systems for. People were wanting to reach out through social media. So if you think through your business systems, we have our marketing person that handles our social media. 
But all of a sudden, like one by one, we are getting messages through our multiple social media accounts and people are sending pictures. They're saying, can you help me? Will I have a room? I can't call. This is what's happening. And, and, and you think through your business structure, right? Our marketing person isn't trained in crisis response, um, but needing to set up a system where we can immediately send them to the crisis response team. Uh, we started publicizing an email address. We created an email address for crisis response team. We started publicizing it. That email address could be called or text because we were finding that fewer and fewer people had the, the physical ability to call because they were we were practicing shelter in place and they were not able to physically pick up the phone and call to let somebody know that they needed help. Um, so other COVID related concerns would be the fear of going anywhere. So even though they needed help, the concern over, I don't want to go to a shelter. Like that might be more dangerous to go to a shelter than to stay in this environment. Like I, I don't like feeling or being treated the way I'm being treated, but at least I know what I'm going to get at home. I don't know what I'm going to get or get exposed to um, at a shelter environment. And so really dissecting uh, those kinds of things. So from a client perspective, um, not only did we see in calls increase um, in the beginning, um, but then we saw people reach out in completely different ways. What I, what I will say is we saw the violence, the type of violence increase, the physical violence. Um, we do what's called a lethality assessment on all of our intakes, and it's 15 questions that are high predictability indicators um, that somebody would be murdered. Um, and they are questions like, you know, do you, does your partner have a gun? Has your partner ever threatened to kill you? Um, those kinds of questions. And there's 15 questions. And we saw people answering yes to more of those questions. I think our average score was um, near 10 that people were answering. Um, it, was, it was nine, 9.7, I believe, that people were answering to those questions that yes to those questions. We saw a lot more strangulation. Um, and that is, an, an, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more in that in society. Um, and I think there's just a miscommunication about the physical effects of communication um, that it has on those who um, are being abused because there are no wounds, right? Oftentimes you don't see bruise. You don't see anything with strangulation, um, but not only is it a high lethality predictor um, that if somebody's going to strangle you, there's a higher likelihood that they will kill you, um, but there is significant physical uh, damage that can happen um, not only to your throat, to your trachea, but brain damage that can happen depending on the length of time um, that somebody is strangled. And so just ongoing education and training of our team so that they can articulate that. Um, obviously, from an operational perspective, it completely changed the way we operated. Um, we all of a sudden had to become quick experts in infection control. Um, we had to quickly look at what were we doing uh, from a service perspective uh, what did we have to keep doing? Um, we have multiple granting agencies, several that are government grants, reaching out to them to say, what are your expectations of us at this time? Um, some of them proactively sent an email and said, like, look, we know that this is crazy. We know that there is so much un uncertainty. Um, know that we will continue to support you, do what you need to do to make the best judgment to provide the services you can. And others really kind of held us to a line of, you know, you have to stay open and you have to fill your shelter and you have to, you have to um, maintain services um, regardless of whether or not that funding agency was making changes or, 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 or changing up their services. The expectation was that, that those that they were funding were going to continue on. Um, we have had in our strategic plan for goal in a site for a couple years away that we wanted to get into telehealth. Well, in a three day period of time, we figured out how to do telehealth um, because we tried to reduce as much in-person interaction um, until we figured out what was going on and especially when shelter in place occurred. Um, and so there have been so many blessings and benefits out of this that we can really celebrate um, because now um, a client who doesn't have transportation, who doesn't have childcare, can still have a counseling session. They can still call the crisis hotline. They can do their case management. They can figure out their housing without having to physically come in. And those systems and setups have been created. Um, even from a team building perspective, we as an agency, our staff is 100 people. And we struggle to find a facility where we can have all staff meetings. And lo and behold, 
once a week now. We have all staff calls just through uh, through uh, Zoom or another uh, fashion that we use. And so um, there have been a lot of things that we can celebrate, uh, but really trying to figure out, um, especially within our emergency shelter, because it is communal in nature, meaning it is a shared kitchen. It is a shared enrichment center. There is a shared living room space. The rooms didn't have televisions. They are small rooms. They are mostly bunk beds and a dresser because originally, obviously, the setup of the goal is to get people to develop strong, healthy relationships to be um, to improve their mental health by by not being closed into their room. And immediately, our mind went to how do we get people to stay in their rooms? And so it was a quick turnaround, right? You see, so you, you totally shift your thinking. Um, it's like we need to put televisions in the room and then oh goodness our Wi-Fi signal is not very good So how do we get Wi-Fi in the rooms Um, how to get activity packs every single day? You know our enrichment center was a safe haven um, Sometimes we'll have up to 80 kids in our safe house And so it was a safe haven for those kids. So not only were they not in school um, Our enrichment center couldn't be utilized by multiple people at a time um, and now they're cooped up in a room and so we had to quickly make adjustments um, how to uh, put things in their room that would entice them and keep them in there, like um, a television, um, how to get them schoolwork. Uh, we had our enrichment center team doing twice a day activity packs and snack distributions, um, doing coaching and parenting through multiple ways. Um, and that would be not just in our shelter, but um, we had up to 45 families at a time in a motel. Um, and so that changed food distribution, um, we had some agency partners that assisted with us. Um, um, EPU helped do some activity bags, um, but but it was a moving target every single day. Um, and 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 I'm not going to lie, it was it was an interesting challenge um, creating safety policies that never existed um, and trying to change human behavior because I think individually we've all personally struggled with human behavior change, right? If we have to talk about like how much we hate these things. Um, anymore, right? They drive us crazy. Um, they drive us crazy. We're not sure if they actually protect us because there was messaging when this first came out that it's actually more harmful to wear a mask if you wear it inappropriately. And now we've been told that in the state of California, we have to wear a mask. Um, so the messages themselves are confusing. And as an employer in this area, how do you how do you shift with the wind and the changing uh, messages that come out and mandates? And also reiterate to your staff, like, as much as you don't want to wear this, you have to. Um, and it's not a fun place to be in. And yet at the end of the day, like, it's our goal not only to protect them, but to protect our team members. Um, May 1, about May, um, changed. And what we saw is not only was shelter in place slowly lifted, um, probably a little bit before that, people weren't following it. And I don't know what it is like in your communities. Um, but the weather was beautiful and everybody was outdoors and where there was leeway, people were taking it. Um, so even as numbers went up, and obviously, I don't know about you, but in our community, we're seeing big spikes now, um, shelter in place was lifted. So as an agency, we had to say, okay, so if we aren't doing in-person uh, clinical work, we're not doing in-person drop-in assessments, everything kind of went virtual except for our residential stuff. Um, how do we can how do we slowly open right if, if, if people can go to a restaurant if they can go to a gym uh, they should be able to come into our buildings and get services um, and so you know we slowly started putting precautions in place and what do those systems look like and how will we take temperature checks and where will we take them um, and and as you slowly do that um, you know inevitably it's like well so and so doesn't feel good well let's change this and and um, it's it's no I, there's no other way to describe it other than it's been a constant, constant um, moving target. Um, I was asked to talk, we talked a little bit about funding. I talked about our granting agencies. Um, you know, one of the things that we have been unbelievably blessed with, it was really hard. Uh, our only fundraiser of the year was scheduled for March 27th. Um, and March 13th was when the school shut down and shelter in place started. Um, and it was hard to make the, the decision to cancel our only fundraiser. Um, and we were worried because not only did we cancel that, uh, we didn't know if we were going to be able to reschedule it. We started to watch our funder, our private funders, um, people be financially impacted by COVID-19 and wondering, were they gonna be able to continue their private support? 
And then obviously our costs were escalating. We had, again, to carry unplanned 45 families a day in, a, in, in alternative housing such as, as a motel. Um, the increased costs for all the IT costs that we discussed to be able to still provide services through technology, um, as well as, I mean, significant increase in cleaning supplies. Um, and, and as all of us have struggled, you know, to find things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer, for those of us running businesses, again, seven locations, 100 employees, and about 150 clients, when you need toilet paper or you need milk, or you need hand sanitizer, or even you need seven temporal thermometers to be able to check temperatures was nothing short of a nightmare. I mean, we were, I was sending employees out to each buy two jugs of milk just so that the kids in the safe house had milk because there was a limit on milk. Um, thankfully, I, I happened to be in Rotary with um, one of our local dairies and I, I did call in a favor at one point and said, look, I just need a favor today, just today. I just need some milk. Um, but those are things you don't plan for and those are things you don't think about um, or dealing with just general fears, right? Um, every one of us has dealt with a different level of fear about what COVID-19 means to us. And we have to take a step back and say, um, is my fear related to COVID-19? Is my, you know, is this my fear of catching any other illness? Is this just because it's unknown? Um, I, I have definitely learned through this process is that we all have bifurcated fears. Uh, we may have fears of going to one place, but we don't have fears of going to a family function, right? For some reason, if somebody is known to us, they share the same last name, maybe we go to the same church or I see them all the time at the grocery store, that it's okay that they're not wearing a mask and it's okay that I give them a hug. But for some reason, for that person that I don't know who they are and they don't look like me or act like me and I'm unfamiliar from them, that they must be the disease carriers. And so um, just working with both clients and staff on just having open dialogue and communication and processing of those things is extremely important. Um, so in the midst of uh, COVID, we are now hitting summertime. In Fresno, summer, uh, actually the entire Central Valley, summer is the busiest season for all violence, domestic violence included. So when people ask me how did COVID really impact survivors of domestic violence, um, I say at this point, we don't know because we're in summer and summer is such a busy period uh, for us. So um, my personal fears are that we are headed back towards some form of shelter in place because everybody's numbers are going back up. Um, and you saw Yosemite, I don't know if you saw today, Yosemite reclosed and you're going to start hearing, I, I firmly believe you'll start hearing other people start to um, close back up again. I don't know if it'll be universal across the state, um, but I, I do believe at some point um, we will tighten up restrictions again. So that combined with what was always our busy period, which is summer, um, does give me pause for concern. And yet I do know that I have a very, very strong and very, very resilient team who has weathered the last three months pretty, pretty well um, and continue to provide services um, without really skipping a beat and that they'll be able to meet that. But, um, but that is something that does give me a little bit of additional concern and some sleepless nights. Um, and then I did want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about, um, about the really, really heightened racial conversations that are happening, because that too is affecting not only us, but it's affecting survivors. Um, and, and, and as we discussed again, talking through my lens, um, if you can't tell, I am not a person of color. Um, I grew up in a home where I had two parents, um, and and I have never um, unintentionally skipped a meal. Um, and so I know that that's the lens by which I, I, I personally look at this. I also know that I run an organization that is named after an African-American woman. And there's a lot of weight that that carries. I have heard and I've listened from survivors, from families, from kids, from, from staff, from survivors, um, how this has changed and impacted them. Um, and so just being able to be nimble and be a good listener and have conversations um, and also put together a plan. Um, I think sometimes we as individuals 
are really, really good at stating our opinions, right? We all have them. We all have a bias. We all have an opinion. Um, we all, uh, no matter how long you have been alive, right, you are shaped by messages. You know, we talk about that our bodies are what we put in them, but so are our minds and our brains. And, um, you know, as we have walked through this journey in the last uh, 30 days, probably, is that we've also noticed that we're going to have to, uh, separate from COVID, really put s systematic plans in place to say, how are we looking at how this impacts survivors? What are our policies? What are our procedures? You know, we have a strategic plan uh, that I will uh, openly admit has a very weak action plan. Um, when you're running in the type of business we are, I feel like we're in ER all the time. So we're on a hamster wheel. And what always gets set on the wayside is putting the planning together and those steps in place. And so, um, so we have been intentional. We're participating on a statewide level uh, with, with different organizations to say, what can we do to be a part of the solution? Um, let's take blame off. Let's take anything else off. Let's say, let's give some tangible steps. And it doesn't mean just a meeting. And you know, that was part of the conversation. I, I, as I mentioned when we started, you know, I, I participated in a panel at my church yesterday um, on racism in the church. And and the one thing that came out of it is there was a start. But if it's a one and done, it does nothing. Um, and so what do, what do we put into place from an operational policies, um, from how we staff people, from how we schedule people, from the activities that in an outreach perspective we participate in, uh, really doing some strong evaluation in those areas to make sure that they match our core values and that they match our mission statement. Um, because it's easy to it's easy to miss if you aren't intentionally looking for it. So, I in closing, I just wanted to say it is it's an honor to serve. I, I missed also that we didn't get to meet. <laughs> I have uh, really been blessed every year by the the conference that Serving USA puts on. Um, not only is it a, sometimes a little bit of a respite from the hamster wheel, um, but I'm also always challenged. I'm always encouraged. Um, I wish I could say how many times I've used Kelly Talamo's stuff over the last uh, last at least year, um, and it, and I just wanted to say that I appreciate it. And then I have missed intersecting and visiting and getting to connect with each of you. And uh, I was just so thankful for, for the opportunity to share today. But I also wanted just to take some time to ask answer any questions you might have. And again, if anyone has any questions uh, who hasn't joined us by video already, please uh, use either the chat box or raise your hand and we can unmute you and let you join the conversation. Nicole, I, I have a question. It's uh, obviously we don't know what the, the new normal is going to look like, but assuming that it's closer to what it was and not what it is now, how much of the, um, the, the new types of operations that are going on do you see sticking regardless of what that new normal kind of looks like um i for sure i hope that the virtual stuff stays as much as i love in person i have recognized that the, the walls are ripped off and, and i'll give you an example of something we have not yet started but i'm excited to start um I don't know why my church keeps getting brought into this, but I, I think it's so fresh in my mind right now. So my particular church hosts National Day of Prayer every year. Um, and usually there's about 80 people in the audience. Um, because of COVID, um, the entire thing was virtual. It didn't mean that some people didn't come up to participate. The participants um, in the National Day of Prayer didn't come in, in, on site, but the entire thing was streamed. Um, there were about 2,500 people that participated online through National Day of Prayer versus 60. Um, we talk about our youth-led programs and how um, there have been barriers about how do you find times, how do you fight for attention for young adults, right? They're teens, they're on campuses, they have schoolwork, they have sports, they have other activities, they have jobs, and you're fighting for their time. Um, but could we create an environment where we're having these, these meeting groups where they can talk and they can process um, parent trainings? Um, parents don't have the time to come off site or take off work and come and listen about teen dating violence, but could they listen to a session like this for 30 minutes online? 
uh, creating a space where we're talking about how to have those hard conversations with your kids where you can start and stop and, and open that dialogue. Um, I think those are going to be hugely important. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, our, our batteries intervention program shut down when COVID happened. Shut down. We unfortunately had to lay off those employees temporarily. The entire thing shut down because we had anywhere from 10 to 15 adults or teens. Um, the men and women group are separate, but we had them all in there in a room, probably the size of my office, sitting in a small circle, right, tightly together with chairs. Um, these are mostly people who have uh, are part of AB 109. They were early released from prison um, and or they had been convicted or this condition of their parole or probation. And we had to shut it down because there was no alternative. Um, and thankfully, we worked with probation to say, look, we have a product. We can use Zoom. We actually use a product called Ring Central, which is actually our phones. Um, if we get the waivers done, for those that can participate and have the technology to do so, can we start this? And we are almost to the point now where almost every one of our clients, I mean, there's a small percentage that either didn't have the technology or their situation changed, but we have about 17 groups up and running today through that product. And, um, and for those of you that work uh, with those who are in incarceration or recently uh, um, out of incarceration, you know that there's 100,000 barriers to them. And I never in a million years thought that this type of situation would be a benefit. And when we hosted that first group, the, act, the ones that got on that first group were so relieved. They're like, this feels so good to be back in this group and to have a time and a place to process. Um, and so there are so many things uh, that I wish I could say could continue, but, but really the, the use of technology and the telehealth for sure is one of them. It also, from an operational perspective, has me thinking, um, again, our shelter is communal in nature. And um, one of the things that was a barrier as we thought through was there isn't a way to fully isolate somebody in there, right? Because the bathrooms are shared. Um, and so as I think through like long-term vision, you know, how, what do you need and what do survivors need? Well, I think they need a bathroom in their own room. And I don't know that I can provide that for them right now, but if I'm looking from a visionary standpoint, um, of what we need and what we think needs to happen, um, this has really just highlighted, um, some gaps and some barriers and some opportunities, um, that can be explored later down the road. I want to say, Nicole, that you're um, amongst, um, I'm just looking at the list of everybody who's on the call, uh, just about everyone here that I can recognize has something very relatable going on in their organization. And I really appreciate you sharing. I think that um, it's re refreshing your honesty and the approach that you've taken, but it's also very reassuring, I think, to know that, you know, we're not alone. Other people are going through the exact same thing. And, uh, Dan didn't mention that, you know, he, he himself works with a women's and men's reentry home at the bridge. Um, and you can see Cheryl, I don't know if Cheryl, if you would like to share at all. Um, she's with Teen Challenge in Linwood. And I had heard about how COVID was delaying um, people being entered into the sobriety programs. Um, has that changed at all, Cheryl? Are you guys be able to be back to normal now? Um, it, it has changed as of April 27th. We started accepting uh, new um, students into the programs, but we had to set up um, two separate isolation areas. So uh, for the women, we set it up in Bakersfield at the Women's Induction Center in a whole separate area. And for the men, we set up an induct, uh, a isolation quarantine um, station with um, a certain number of individuals. I think they could only do 15 at a time in Reedley at the Teen Challenge Central Valley location. So for two weeks, those individuals in both the women's and the men's would stay 
uh, for two weeks and then they would be transferred. We actually, our various centers would go pick them up in Bakersfield and then bring them to the respective centers. You know, we have our women's home in Linwood um, and also the men's homes are San Diego, Santa Ana, Shafter, and Reedley. So um, every two weeks, new people would come in, uh, make sure everything was going well, and they would be transferred. So that started April 27th. Cheryl, did you let them leave once they're there? Oh, no. Yeah. No. Um, in, in our residential centers, nobody, nobody has been able to leave. Even in our existing programs, um, we, um, uh, the individuals have stayed. All of our residential centers are um, uh, basically on um, shelter in place. Um, we, uh, even with the staff members, um, as best as we could, and then along the way, we're, we're having some phased uh, reopenings for the staff members that live on site. <clears throat> Excuse me, and also um, the students. So um, if an individual chose to leave the program, uh, they would have to go through the whole process over again, um, starting with the isolation for two weeks. Um, it, it, it was unfortunate. A few of them did leave in um, uh, April, um, but uh, since then, thankfully, most individuals have stuck it out and, and uh, continue with the program. Yeah. I think that was one of our biggest challenges. Um, we, we are an emergency shelter program for for survivors of domestic violence. And, and honestly, one of our core values is, is, is our job is to not be another controlling person in their life. Um, and so we really, we really wrestled with um, that delicate balance between operational control, right? I wanna protect everybody, I wanna control my environment, you know, and wanting to, con wanting honestly operational control. But that balance between if I can go to the supermarket, how do I tell somebody they have to stay stuck in their small room and not go anywhere? Because that's not really fair to them. It's not fair. That's me needing to address my fears and say, is our health and safety and our infection control policy and do we have adequate hand washing stations and have we talked to them about um, policies and procedures? Are we holding people accountable for not following policies and procedures? Um, and so it's definitely been a little bit of a, a it, it, that has been probably one of the biggest challenges is saying like, I, it's not my job to control how you live your life. You know, we, we, I did work quickly with an attorney and put together a policy and a new document that they particularly signed knowing that there's a risk and we're in a pandemic. Um, the other is um, from the onset, I was, I was panicked for two reasons. One, you know, we were governed by the Violence Against Women Act and very, very strict high level confidentiality laws. And I thought my quick decision making tree was if somebody gets it and public health wants to come in and test everybody, what do I say? I don't know. I don't know what the law says I can do. I don't know what the law says I can't do. I mean, there was no roadmap for this. And then going back to, I'm a single, I'm the only one of my kind in this, you know, in Fresno, um, and the others again are so much smaller. Um, I didn't really have too many people. We were kind of, I was really calling LA. I was calling my partners in Sacramento that had larger agencies to say, "Help! What are we doing? How do we figure this out?" Um, but, but, but that was probably my biggest concern at the beginning: is what do we do? Again, you know, public health at the front door is saying, "Hey, we got to call somebody to test positive. We have to come in here and test everybody." And then what, if that information gets out? I mean, we can't tell anybody who's in there in the first place. Um, public health isn't bound by the same laws and regulations that we are. So um, I definitely had a lot of those, that, that occupied my first couple weeks for sure. Yeah, we, we navigated through a lot of those same um, struggles and questions and, and issues and, uh, thankfully, Teen Challenges Southern California as a whole um, has uh, a very good executive leadership team and uh, had the foresight to um, seek legal counsel and navigate through uh, some of those same challenges. So 
uh, I believe that better days are coming for all of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't ask me what we hope we get rid of from this. <laughs> Yeah, the, and the other obviously layered, you know, for those of you with, you know, the, with any number of employees, but those of you who have employees that are working on site, obviously the, um, the governor's executive order on workers' compensation and all the different layered leaves. Um, in addition, my HR director transitioned to another organization on May 5th, so I, learning that on the fly has been super fun and exciting. Um, I, it's the best professional development I didn't ask for, um, but, but yeah, it's complicated. You know, the, the all la layers of, um, of government have implemented different laws, right? You had the, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, then you had the CARES Act, then you had the governor's executive order, and then they say we have shelter in place in Fresno, but not in the state. You know, you're all dealing with these same things, and, you know, employee says, I don't feel good. I'm thinking, okay, what do you qualify for? Like, where's my decision making tree? And, and how does this work? And, you know, and also what's qualifying, what's not, what you can ask, what you can't ask. Um, you know, it's not, it's, you're all in the same space. So I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure. <laughs> I've got, I've got kind of a, an overall question, a non COVID related question, you know, like, uh, Stephanie mentioned, we're, we're doing the addiction recovery thing. So, um, success metrics are, are pretty, pretty cut and dried as to, to what we're doing. How, since the, I mean, you've got such a multifaceted problem there that, that you're dealing with, uh, both in, it sounds like in an emergency kind of, uh, approach as well as, is a, a longer term program kind of approach. How do you guys measure, measure success? Well, you know, prior to this, we had a, you know, we have a pretty robust um, client database um, where, you know, all client information is entered every time that they meet with a case manager, the case managers enter information when they exit, we do a client exit survey. Um, so our, I would say our measurements for success haven't changed. I think we have a lot of room to grow, um, but, but I don't feel like that the COVID measurement of success, or the measurement of success was necessarily impacted by COVID. Um, I don't know that we were able to measure impact of COVID, but I don't know that it altered our, our ability to measure success. But tell me how it measured, how it impacted yours, because maybe I'm just, I'm not, I'm not seeing it in that way. Well, yeah, I guess uh, my, my question really was, is how do you measure success in general? Um, you know, for us, it's uh, we we take a look at at the graduates, graduates, non graduates. Um, what is are you are you still sober? Are you still um, uh, a, a, a cohesive part of society going forward? And you're right, um, COVID has not affected those kind of metrics at all. I mean, it's it's what society is 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 kind of wonky right now since we can't you know meet and so forth and so on, but. Uh, but the the metrics aren't there just but just overall um what are you what are you collecting as far as success metrics yeah so i will say we collect a lot of data uh what we don't have are really built-in metrics for success and i don't know a single domestic violence agency that does because of the fact that if you use things like decrease in calls is that a good thing or not? I don't know. You know, if you talk to um, people right now have been terrified about the decrease in calls for child abuse, terrified, because they know that it doesn't mean it's not happening, but the schools are shut down and the places where they mostly get reported are not accessible. And so does, do, does a decrease in domestic violence calls actually mean a decrease in domestic violence? Probably not, not unless it's sustained and it's seen across the board by social service agencies, law enforcement, and nonprofit, and unless everybody is measuring. Um, we talk about this even with our offender program. Um, we're part of it, obviously, the, the CCP AB 109, right? Um, because we are a small piece of that, that big uh, project in central, uh, central Fresno. And they can't even figure out like what is success and i listened you know all these different department heads uh from 
sheriff and, and uh, district attorney and probation and the courts and everybody else because the question is, is we haven't really necessarily identified it, right? Is it that they don't reoffend at all? Or is it not a success if they get a DUI, right? If they were a violent criminal and they've gotten a DUI, does that mean that they have failed in success? Or is it considered a success if they don't create another violent offense? You know, and, or is it the same offense? And so I think as, as, a, as a society, we are, we are honing in on that. When I talk about things that as far as our strategic plan, that is another one that we are, we're highly um, in tune to and focused on. With our AB 109 grant, we have done some research specifically as it relates to um, success in the program, right? How many sessions did they complete? How does that correlate to their ACES score? How does that correlate to um, when they got referred post-release? Um, and really try to identify like what works best. And so we had, do have some systems set up in our housing programs. There are things like, um, did they transition to a permanent housing place? Um, once they finished their rapid rehousing program, were they able to keep it? Um, were they able to keep a job? I mean, there's lots of different metrics based on our program of what we're looking at. Um, in our school-based programs, we do climate surveys, school climate surveys on what we do pre and post tests. So at the beginning of the year, we test knowledge of teen dating violence. Um, and at the end of the school year, we test knowledge. And so we do have some measurement tools um, built in. The, the biggest challenge I see um, with survivors, um, and I can only liken it to a, a past experience. Um, I had, a, I worked at Valley Children at a children's hospital prior to coming to Marjorie Mason Center. And um, there were some areas of the hospital that just people didn't wanna go back to. One was the oncology ward. Like if you had a child that was a survivor of childhood cancer, you were glad to make it out of there, but you didn't wanna go back and visit. And you didn't want to relive that over and over and over again. And what I noticed with survivors is it's the same thing, right? I don't want to, like, they don't, they're not obligated. They're not paying us to come. There's no, there's no transactional obligation for them to have to come back and stay in touch with their case manager. And so really what we'd like to see in long-term success is, is very challenging to measure because it means you've got to be able to communicate with them one year out, two years out, three, five, ten, um, really through the next generation of their family and their children, um, especially if children were um, around when the domestic violence originally happened. And so um, I am working with uh, Fresno State and our criminology department to start those conversations about how could we do some more intentional research. But going back to that original kind of analogy, um, it's, it's a part of people's lives they just want to forget. Yeah. Nicole, I want to thank you again for taking the time to spend with us and enlightening us. Um, one last shout out for anyone else who might have questions or comments before we go. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here. And we thank wish everyone, you, everyone help. Hang in there, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.